colleagues um, said they were watching this on video, or at least, at least gonna watch the recording. And uh, so welcome to you as well. My thanks to Tucker uh, for superintending this series. And uh, I do look forward to uh, sharing a little bit about my approach uh, to teaching two of the courses that I teach in the veterinary college. Um, but they are courses uh, taken by not only vet students, but students in our master's in public health program, master's in food science, and then a range of PhD programs. Um, and to get started, um, I, you know, if, if you find anything like life-changing uh, in today's talk, which is probably unlikely, but let's pretend that that does happen, uh, then just maybe you might want to take or, you know, sit in on um, my, these two classes that I'll be uh, showcasing some excerpts from. One is uh, Trade and Agricultural Health. Uh, this is a course that is designed to introduce students to the international legal frameworks governing trade in animal disease, plant disease, and food safety regulation. So it's a lot of trade policy uh, law and with uh, particular application of, of legal frameworks to things like plant uh, pests and pathogens that threaten the international trade of agricultural products, uh, animal diseases like foot and mouth disease or mad cow disease, and then food safety concerns uh, in the global food trade. So that, that's one course um, that I'll be uh, referring to a little bit. And then the other one is, uh, if I can have favorites, am I allowed to have a favorite course? <laughs> uh, the DMP888 course is really, I'd, I'd say my favorite course. Um, it's probably the most multidisciplinary course that I currently teach. And that's called Globalization Cooperation in the Food Trade. And in that course, we're seeking to uh, introduce to students um, new ways of thinking about managing hazards and risks other than just simple inspection at ports of entry. So a lot of my students will go on and work in areas like import safety with the Food and Drug Administration, or they might go work in animal disease regulation with uh, the Department of Homeland Security or with USDA. And one of the big problems, challenges that we face in the global food system is how do you facilitate trade, uh, guard against bad stuff, guard against um, security and safety threats, um, but do so without completely wrecking trade flows. And to do that, you have to have models of cross-border cooperation. And I talk a lot about that in my DMP 888 course. Um, both courses are electives for the vet students. So the students in the vet curriculum that really have an interest in public health or the food system or trade would take these courses. And then students in the master's in public health and food science programs uh, do as well. By the way, before I get going any further, just real quickly, what are the academic uh, graduate programs represented here? Well, maybe start here. Family studies. Family studies? All right. Education. Agronomy. Agronomy. Fantastic. Agronomy. All right. All right. Court. Good. Okay. Fantastic. Chemistry. Biology. Marine, what's yours? I'm with the Office of Research and Development. I'm, I'm coordinating the Global Food Systems Initiative here on campus. Yeah. So, and then Tucker is, uh, um, he's uh, thoughtfully preparing for his next phase of his PhD. He's now a candidate. That's pretty awesome. So, um, so anyways, but to begin, I want to uh, share a student testimonial. <laughs> 
All right, thank you, Tucker. Yeah, so that's Brittany Wilhite. Um, amongst many things, Brittany uh, drove a long distance to go to K-State, so she's from Alaska. When she finished her master's in August, she had to drive back, it took her six days. And I felt really bad because I gave her advice um, that she should probably get an oil change before she went. And so she went to a certain unnamed uh, um, car oil change place. And I kid you not, they put power steering fluid into her engine. Yes, and caused a lot of problems. So anyway, so I'm indebted to her for making that video, but I'm also indebted to her for giving her really bad advice on where to go get her oil changed. So anyways, more on that some other day. But um, she is now back in Alaska with a repaired car. <laughs> okay, so again, the two courses I'm gonna draw from today um, are uh, DMP 816 and DMP 888. Um, the task at hand for me uh, in these courses, and these courses are not historical courses, they're not uh, in a department of history, they're in the College of Veterinary Medicine. But the, these trade issues that I teach are very multifaceted, and that is why we have to have a multidisciplinary approach, right? And you guys all as graduate students know and appreciate the value of multidisciplinarity. Um, in my trade courses, some of the facets, some of the academic disciplines include those in this um, uh, diagram. So I teach a lot on uh, international law related to trade. Certainly because it's trade, you have countries involved. Um, I also talk you know, a fair amount about the importance of disease surveillance, health data and the like. And then trade itself is an economic activity. So you have the field of, of uh, economics. And then there's the whole world of public health science, maybe animal science, maybe plant science, maybe food microbiology, that whole uh, disciplinary area. And then there's the area of ethics and human behavior. Um, and this includes uh, honorable behavior in um, trade officials, because I want my students, especially those that are gonna go end up being responsible for keeping, you know, seafood at Red Lobster safe for us. I want them to be ethical people, right? Um, so I try to hit on that. And then there's just, you know, every other topic you can imagine in the food, animal, and plant world. So this is a very complex, multifaceted, multidisciplinary teaching task, uh, teaching both DMP 816 and 888. So my approach to combining all of those is to use the academic craft of history. And that word history, of course, if you unpack it, it includes the word stories, right? And so I use stories, okay? And as Brittany alluded to, many of the stories I use are in the 19th century. So when's the 19th century? Is that the 1900s or the 1800s? 1800s, right? So we're talking a long time ago, fairly long time ago, and why do you think I choose cases from the 19th century to teach principles that my students will use in 2019? Why do you think? Yeah, there was a lot of dramatic dr drama for sure. A lot of microbiology is being discovered during that time. A lot of, um, a lot of uh, death and sickness to draw on, yes. Why else do you think though? Yeah, and, and a lot of students, especially vet students, um, and I would say many of the MPH students that I mentor, they really have never spent a lot of time geeking out on history, okay? You know, they're not, they weren't history majors, they weren't political science majors. So for them, the 19th century is kind of a new frontier for them to learn from. Um, plus, I think the 19th century has a lot of um, uh, memorable uh, images. You have people like Queen Victoria. You have people like uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who, the author of, of Sherlock Holmes. You have um, the whole world of microbiological science unfolding with lots of discoveries happening in the 1870s and 1880s. And so it's, it's kind of a watershed uh, 
uh, century. Um, and then I personally like the 19th century just because, as I'll get to later, I have made friends with the great granddaughter of one of the veterinarians who featured prominently during this century. So there's kind of a personal connection too. Now, using stories and teaching is something that's been commended to us by really, really intelligent people like Aristotle. Aristotle taught that you should use stories and not just download principles. And I could do that, right? I could go back to these principles and I could have, and I'm sure no one here has ever experienced anything like this, say a 65 slide uh, Slide, 65 slide PowerPoint presentation with principle after concept after principle after concept. Has anyone suffered through such a lecture? Okay, it's very common. And I could do that. I probably, I probably am guilty of doing some of that. But stories, according to Aristotle, can help us um, sew those concepts together and present them in a more compelling and interesting and what I consider to be most important, memorable way. Because at the end of the day, I want my students to recall the principles, but they're most likely not gonna recall the principles unless I've wrapped those principles, unless I've wrapped those concepts up, in, up into something that is either attractive or interesting or compelling. That's what makes it memorable, right? Um, and so I'm taking a cue from Aristotle. I'm also taking a cue from someone else. Has anyone seen the movie Meet the Parents? Man, my, my pop culture uh, illustrations are totally dated, Tucker. In the movie Meet the Parents, um, you have Ben Stiller, okay, and uh, Luke Wilson. And in this one scene, it's, it's absolutely hilarious. You have these two guys, they're kind of rivals. Um, and one is going to be getting married to... Uh, the, the, the woman that they both like, and Luke Wilson kind of one-ups uh, Ben Stiller by saying that he's a carpenter, okay? And in the history of mankind, who is one of the most famous carpenters but Jesus, okay? So there's this moment where in the movie, it's absolutely hilarious, Luke Wilson says to Ben Stiller, he says, I'm a carpenter, and then, they, and then Ben Stiller says, what made you want to go into carpentry? And he says, well, if you're going to follow in someone's footsteps, then who better than Jesus Christ? <laughs> and and the, the girl is like watching this, and she's just melting even more for Luke Wilson, thinking, oh, man, what an admirable, honorable person, right? But even Jesus taught in stories. And if you're familiar with the, the, the world of church and biblical theology, the fancy word for that is parables, telling uh, moral or ethical stories through, or moral and ethical principles through stories, okay? So Aristotle and Jesus are both using stories, so I figure I'm, I'm on pretty good ground to use stories in my teaching. That's what I try to do. Um, so let me give you some examples, and I'll kind of un unpack um, as I go through these, the pedagogical or the teaching strategy that I've used. And for you in your different disciplines and your different colleges and the courses you teach, um, maybe you can imagine or catch a vision for what this would look like for you, okay? So first, from DMP 888, um, this is one of the slides that I um, give to my students. Um, and I'm going to kind of step into lecture mode here a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm doing. But in... DMP 888, I'm trying to help students understand the economic background for the trade disputes they're going to, to learn about, okay? And I tell them that there was a very famous economic and political thought leader named Richard Cobden. He was a talking head. He was a well-respected thought leader. He was the kind of person that you would bring to a Landon lecture at K-State. He's the kind, he was actually um, brought to Paris and to London to give talks all the time because he was seen to be a really brilliant economic mind, Richard Cobden. Well, in 1862, Richard Cobden was giving an after-dinner speech in Manchester, England. If any of you ever heard of Manchester United, uh, it's a, soccer, a football team or soccer team in England. So he was speaking in Manchester, England in 1862. 
1862 is how many years after Kansas became a state? One year. Kansas became a state in 1861. You guys all knew that, right? And what is the name for the American ev uh, political history event that is going on in 1862 that started the same year Kansas became a state? Maybe someone over here. The Civil War. Well done. Civil War lasted from 1861 up until when? Well done. 1865, Abraham Lincoln assassinated in 1865. By the way, in 1861, Kansas was to become a, or became a state, right? And you could argue that the Civil War itself, to some degree, started because of Kansas, because you had a, um, the, the question of whether Kansas would be a free state or a slave state was highly controversial. Um, for lots of reasons, including the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1855, which declared that territories, Kansas and Nebraska territories, would decide whether they were slave or free by voting and having popular sovereignty determine whether they were pro-slave or free. Kansas eventually did go free, but there were lots of battles, and there was this term for it called bleeding Kansas. And it was really bleeding Kansas that kind of pushed the U.S. over into the Civil War, okay? But that's all just another story, all right? In the Civil War, who are the two um, uh, opponents? You have the North and the South, right? And in war, one of the most effective means to get at your enemy is to not only shoot them, but to cut off their economic trade. So the North has a trade blockade against the South. And Richard Cobden in 1862 is speaking to textile manufacturers in Manchester, England. These are people who had become reliant on cotton coming from the South. But with the trade blockade, what was going on? Disruption to the cotton trade, right? And if you're a textile manufacturer in the north of England, in Manchester, England, and you don't have access to cotton, is that good or bad? That's bad. And they were up in arms about this. They were really frustrated. The Manchester textile manufacturers were really frustrated that they did not have raw material cotton. They didn't have access to raw material cotton from the south because of the trade blockade. But what does Cobden say? Cobden, you know, he stands up in this after-dinner speech, clears his throat, and he makes a statement. He says, you know, you get an article that's actually more important than cotton, your food. And here is a bright economic thought leader telling these Manchester-based textile business people that they're dependent not only on cotton, but also food, okay? Now, what I just did there, I told you a story that talk, touched on the Civil War, that touched on Kansas. One of the advantages I have teaching at K-State is that there are many students from Kansas, okay? And there's many people who have heard of the Civil War. So I've anchored teaching something about what's going on economically to a historical event that a lot of people kind of have a, 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 some familiarity with, right? But then I, I introduced some other principles. What are some principles I introduced in that story? Maybe someone on this side. Maybe how the, the war and situation can lead to like the changes in the economic trade. Excellent. There are there is a disruption in trade that brings about some significant consequence, right? Now, this. Um, little anecdote that I share in this particular module is, you know, probably takes me, I don't know, five minutes. It I think it took me probably five to six minutes to tell you that. What I do is I tell the story of Richard Cobden giving the after, after dinner speech, and then I explain what it all means. And this is really where I'm downloading those principles, those concepts. Now, I could have skipped talking about the Civil War. I could have skipped the after-dinner speech by Richard Cobden. I could have skipped 
the comparison of food with cotton, right? And maybe for the sake of time, that would have been better. But my bet is that it's better to enrobe it all in those stories and give my students the best possible chance to remember it, okay? Now, the principles, the concepts I, I, I try to teach, and then I sort of explain a little bit more, are that 19th century Britain, which is the country in which Manchester's based, was loyal to this concept of free trade. Richard Cobden was an advocate of free trade. He wanted to see more trade happening with other countries. That's what free trade philosophy was all about. But he also noted to these textile manufacturers that Britain was economically dependent, not just on cotton, but also food. And that included livestock and meat imports from the US. And that issue becomes really important in my trade courses to explain. And then I add a little bit more about how um, there were people like Richard Cobden who were wealthy in Britain, who were investing money in US railroads, US farms, US ranches, US milling operations, US meat processing uh, facilities during this time, seeking to get a return on investment, okay? So all that, that's one slide. So what you could do in your courses, let's say you're teaching, what do you teach in biology? <clears throat> Pardon? Plant physiology. Plant physiology. So maybe there is some interesting, compelling, memorable story. And I would, and the place to go, I would think, would be to go into the history of science literature in plant physiology. And it's amazing if you just take the time to do a little bit of reading, even of, dare I say it, pop culture, okay? You can get some fairly uh, accessible and fairly interesting stories to teach principles. Now, in my case, I used a story that was directly relevant to the principles, okay? But sometimes you may wanna use a story that is metaphorically related, meaning it, it may not actually uh, have happened around those actual principles, but somehow illustrate the connection between the principles. I hope that makes sense. So anyways, that's one approach. Um, something else I do in the DMP 88 course is I show pictures of veterinary inspectors. So during this time, there's um, uh, an economic dependence that Britain has on the US, but there's also some concerns about U.S. cattle being exported to Britain carrying certain animal diseases. In my courses, you know, certainly the vet students are interested in studying animal disease and trade. So I show pictures of veterinary inspectors. You can tell it's from the 19th century. You got this guy in the, uh, see if I can, you see he's got the top hat. You know, almost sort of looks, he looks like a 19th century. This is actually a drawing from a, an 1870s magazine, okay? So these veterinary inspectors, you can see this guy's sort of handling this cow. Um, it's depicting it with imagery, in this case a drawing, you might be able to find photographs, the uh, level of scrutiny that was going on at the ports in Britain over animal disease. But not just that. Um, there are, in, in my, the era that I study, the 19th century, there's a lot of impressive and really interesting artwork in the scientific textbooks of the day. So here's one, it's a drawing of, a, of the particular disease of concern, contagious bovine pleuronemonia. This is the same disease that uh, Brittany in the student uh, testimonial mentioned. You know, and again, I could say animal disease is a problem. I could just un download that principle, that concept. But instead what I've done is I've chosen some images and I have included a little bit of text to explain the images. Finally, the go-to place, of course, to tell stories is the media. Whether it's a modern day newspaper, or in my case, going into the archives of the, the London Times or the New York Times, here's a headline about the trade dispute that I have my students study. This is from the New York Times. And notice all the highly emotive, almost dramatic language. And this is in real life. You have headline, fearing cattle disease, right? You can imagine that today, say, with respect to something like BSE or mad cow disease. 
England's check to American shipments, alarm and anxiety in both countries. And very quickly, the students, by seeing this newspaper um, article scan, they quickly get almost an emotional feel for what it would have been like to read that news item in that day. Not too differently than what we experience and have experienced in modern day trade politics over animal disease and food safety. Okay, so what did I do there? So I identified the principles and concepts that I wanted to teach, and that might be the approach. What's your name? Rachel. So Rachel, what Rachel could do in plant physiology, she could say, okay, I'm gonna give a lecture today, and I wanna get across you know, concept A, principle B, concept C, idea D. You just write them out, okay? So I was clear in my mind about what I wanted to teach. And then I thought, okay, what are the elements of a story? Well, obviously humans are in stories, interesting people. So I found Richard Cobden. Uh, maybe I could find a newspaper headline. Maybe an, you can just take a snapshot of an internet web page from a newspaper. Um, and then what pictures can I find? You know, maybe you, you go into the history of science literature and you get some actual images. Now this is hard work, right? This takes time. But I would argue, even, I mean, my slides are not the most impressive, right? They're just black background, white text, pretty lame. My time in preparing for class is better spent finding images, finding people, finding newspaper headlines. That is how I prepare to package the principles and concepts into something worth remembering. And then incidentally, in this course, my final exam is an oral exam. So I have the students show up in my office. Uh, a lot of my students are online now, so they will Zoom with me, okay? By the way, they're probably all cheating. They probably have all the answers around the screen, right? If I'm asking them the questions, I'll say, stare at me, don't look off. But when I ask them uh, the final exam questions, which are all about the principles and the concepts, it is so rewarding as a teacher. And I'm sure you've, you've experienced this when you see a student kind of get it. But in my case, the most fulfilling and rewarding moments are when they tell me, they teach me back the principle and concept and they say things like what happened with contagious bovine pleural pneumonia, like what Richard Cobden was saying in the after dinner speech. You see that? And that, if they, if they are using that language in the oral exam, there's a pretty good chance that the concept and the principle has indeed stuck. Okay? All right, any questions about that before I go on? You guys good? Hanging with me here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what I do is I do tell this, actually that video I showed you that Brittany recorded, first time this semester I've done this, I have the students, before they get into the historical reading material, I have them watch this. Because if you notice, she starts out by throwing out all these impressive animal disease and veterinary terms. And she also clearly says, Masters of Science in Veterinary Biomedical Sciences. So the students in my courses who are not typically interested in history, but are interested in animal disease or science, when they hear a, a peer say, history is pretty cool. You know, you're gonna read about history in Dr. Cashman's class, warning, but it's actually really interesting. You're gonna to get to learn about how veterinarians and physicians work along, alongside each other. And, and then I do in class say to them, listen, I know you're not all in love with history, but just give it a try. And, and not all of my readings are from the 19th century, okay? You know, I'm certainly not teaching them. I'm teaching them international legal principles from 2019, um, but I'm using these historical narratives to, to tease out principles. In your name? Kathleen, thank you. All right, should we move on? All right, so from another class from DMP 816, one of the principles, trade policy principles, I have to teach the vet students, because some of them, if they end up going to work in the federal government, will be responsible for this trade policy concept, is something called regionalization. And regionalization is basically a way that large countries like the US and Mexico 
and Brazil and Argentina and other countries can um, trade by distinguishing between the disease status of certain areas. So in the United States, we trade, we import a lot of cattle from Mexico. Mexico is a very large country. And it turns out that in Mexico, in the South, there is really poor animal disease regulation. So you have bovine brucellosis, bovine tuberculosis, all these diseases that are really a problem and that we don't want to import into the United States. But in the north of Mexico, in the Mexican state of Chihuahua, for example, there is really robust, really good, really tight animal disease control. And regionalization is a trade policy model that is used and is explicitly affirmed in international law by the World Trade Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE, as a means by which countries can say to, like the United States can say to Mexico, we're not going to import all your cattle, but we will import cattle from Chihuahua. And it's a really, really helpful tool for trade regulators to have at their disposal, because if you're trading with a large country like Mexico, where there's huge variation in animal disease regulation, or if you're trading, say, with China, where you're concerned about, say, particular food safety practices in one province, but feeling good about the food safety practices in another province, regionalization provides a trade policy model for making trade happen, but still keeping people uh, safe, right? Or animals or plants safe, whatever it may be. May be. So that's a kind of a uh, complicated concept, right? So what do I do? I use history. Actually, first what I do is I give them the Code of Federal Regulations, which is not very effective, okay? Um, when I talk about regionalization, I tell them that we have to evaluate regionalization cases on the basis of eight factors, and, I, and these are the eight factors, okay? And basically, if the eight factors are not satisfied, or if we're not satisfied, say, with Mexico or Chihuahua meeting the eight factors, then we don't import cattle from them, all right? But again, that's kind of boring, isn't it? You're all nodding, yeah, that's very boring, okay? So what do I do? I give a historical example, and I go straight back to that period of history that they've already read a little bit about, which is in the late 1800s, 19th century, and I tell the story about how there was a Harvard-based veterinarian named Charles Lyman who was hired and sent by the U.S. Commissioner of Agriculture to go to Britain and to argue to Britain, we do have this disease, but it's not everywhere. In fact, it's only in the red-shaded counties on this map. And so Charles Lyman created this map um, in uh, 1880, and he shaded in red the counties where there was this disease, okay? And we'll come back to this a little bit later, but it's really interesting. Notice, here's Long Island, New York. Here is Manhattan. Brooklyn is on Long Island, New York, and notice that Brooklyn is in red. Okay, we'll come back to that later. But everywhere west of the red, it's cream-colored. And Lyman's argument was that we have a West, Western disease-free area. And this became known as the disease-free West argument. Okay, so you have a bunch of Americans, including a veterinarian named Charles Lyman from Harvard. You know, anyone from Harvard's intelligent, right? At least we think that. So he goes over, we send our best Harvard veterinarian to Britain to argue that our disease-free West region is, is a safe place to source cattle from. And what do you think the Brits end up saying? They end up picking apart what are basically the eight factors. They say things like, um, you don't have veterinary control and oversight, which by the way, they were right. And then they say, you have not uh, really done a good job of documenting the history of this disease. Oh, and by the way, you don't have any, we don't have any assurance that the cattle you're sending us are in fact from the Western states. For all we know, they could be coming from Brooklyn dairies. 
And so pretty quickly, it becomes clear to Dr. Lyman, that Harvard veterinarian, that he cannot convince the Brits, the British veterinary authorities, that this is a reliable map. And therefore, the disease-free West argument does not get accepted, okay? Again, why do I tell this story? Kathleen? It shows where the eight principles came from. Yeah, exactly, well done. And it's also um, because you have people like Charles Lyman, you know, after all, a Harvard veterinarian, unable to convince the Brits that shows just how difficult it must be to assure any government that you've met the regionalization factors. You see that? Okay. All right, what did I do? I identified the challenging modern day trade policy model that I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach regionalization. And again, I could have just told them, go read the Code of Federal Regulations and we'll have a quiz on it. But I don't find that to be particularly inviting, okay? And so what I did was I found a historical precedent or antecedent for regionalization, in this case, what Dr. Lyman argued, the map he made, blah, 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 to illustrate just how difficult it was for him to convince the Brits, how difficult it is to implement regionalization. Okay? All right, before I go on, any questions about that approach? How are we doing, Tucker, on time? How many? Perfect, okay. All right, now let's move on to what I think really is the, um, the heart of history, and that is the discipline of biography. What's a biography? Your name? Logan. Logan? What's, what's a biography, Logan? Biography would be the story of a person. Well done, exactly. Isn't it more interesting to read the story of a person than even just the story of a trade dispute. I mean, a trade dispute is kind of interesting, but wouldn't it be more interesting if we could get inside the mind of some historical character? Wouldn't that be really cool? Biography is one way that we can do that. One of my favorite quotes from the discipline of history comes from Derek Brewer. He wrote a lot of books on um, the development of uh, 13th and 14th century uh, society in England, including uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. But he makes this statement, he says, the various aspects of life which in history we inevitably divide are to or were to the living all ones. That's kind of deep. Can someone say, that's deep, Justin? Can you say that? Okay. It's a deep quote. What's he saying? Logan, what's he saying? He's trying to separate all of these things out, but in reality, they must be followed all Exactly. Just like you and me today. We got up, we came to campus, we didn't just have a financial experience, we didn't just have a political experience, we didn't just have a social experience, we didn't just have a weather experience. Actually, we all had a kind of a surprising weather experience, right? No, you and I experience life in all those aspects that we might be tempted to divide as one. And that is why biography, the life of a person, the experiences of a person, the psyche of a person is so helpful for integrating all of these multidisciplinary concepts. You know, I would say the best way for me to integrate law and the countries involved and the health data and the science and the ethics is to find a few people, in my case, they're oftentimes veterinarians, who were involved in some issue, but that issue created opportunities for them to experience all of these, okay? So biography is a way to integrate multidisciplinary concepts. So I don't know, um, Rachel, in plant physiology, are there some famous pioneers that you can think of? I'm not gonna be able to remember them right now. That's fine, that's fine. Yeah, so you would go into the history of science literature 
and maybe you would find some exemplary scientific pioneers. Who was in, uh, was it consumer sciences or family studies? So who's the most famous family studies um, uh, scholar? Okay, so you might use him, him, to teach lots of disparate concepts related to family studies, okay? So that's, that's really the method, methodological approach here is that you're using a particular person, a real life person preferably, <laughs> to tell uh, your multidisciplinary narrative. Okay, some examples from uh, DMP888. One of the things I do is I uh, share some interesting characters, some of whom I have pictures of, some of whom I don't have pictures of. So I have a picture of Dr. John Gamgee. This guy was an absolute um, maverick in his day. A lot of people called him an alarmist. He was um, writing letters to the editor. He was almost like sort of, he was like rage tweeting out. And we know that term rage tweeting. We've developed a familiarity with that in our society. Dr. Gamgee was rage uh, writing letters to the editor in the London Times saying, we have got to guard against render pest, which was a big animal disease concern in continental Europe at the time. When he was writing in Britain, he said, listen, if we don't implement some uh, livestock controls, we're gonna get this disease. And he wrote letter after letter to the editor after letter to the editor. And actually he ended up being right. Uh, in Belgium, there was a, um, uh, a member of the Ministry of Agriculture named Alphonse Van Den Piraboom. I do not have a picture of him. If you find a picture of him, please email it to me because I'd like to update my slides. And both of these people basically sounded the alarm about the risk of livestock disease. But they were written off by their colleagues as being kind of, you know, nuts, you know, doomsday or doomsdayers. But both had paid attention to the epidemiological history in continental Europe uh, regarding rinderpest. That's one of the concepts I'm trying to get my students to appreciate, you know, the importance of studying the disease patterns of a particular animal disease. Gamgee in Britain and Van den Piraboom in Belgium advocated for disease prevention and disease containment policies, but they were criticized as being excessive, okay? So on this slide in DMP888, what I then do is I push it back to the students and I say, okay, do you think that these two figures were alarmists like their peers said, or do you think they were just proactive uh, leaders, you know, doing the hard work of leadership to take a stand and be differentiated? And so we have this discussion and we're getting at just what it might be like for them one day to have to take a stand as a scientist, right? And that's what we want. I mean, our land grant mission, uh, last time I checked, Tucker, is that we're supposed to serve society. I think that's somewhere buried <laughs> in our mission, right? It's in there somewhere. And, but we have in um, Gamgee and Vanden Piraboom some exemplars, some real life biographical characters that I have the students read about. Okay, any questions about that approach? Logan, we hanging in there? Okay. Okay, this one's going to be a little more complex, and um, I'm kind of, I'm not disappointed, but uh, it's too bad there's, is anyone here interested in One Health? Have you ever heard that term? Okay, for maybe a few people watching this on video. So, One Health is a uh, it's almost become a buzzword in the human health and veterinary medicine world, okay? One health is the idea that we should stop having a uh, categorization of health hazards being only human-related or animal-related. And we need to also be thinking about environmentally-based health threats that could be a threat to both animals and humans. So you think of something like um, climate change. Climate change is a quintessential one health task, right? Because with climate change, you could have changes in particular vectors like mosquitoes and disease uh, being spread uh, to, to animals, but also to humans. 
um, with climate change, you might have that being caused by human behavior, but there's also consequence for um, what it might mean for, say, raising of livestock, okay? Anyways, the One Health concept um, in many of the discussions in the veterinary college and in the MPH program is that we need to get the physicians, the MDs, back partnering with the veterinarians, okay? And incidentally, just as an aside, I'm teaching a course this semester for, for incoming freshmen who are pre-vet and pre-med. And I'm using a lot of these kinds of cases, uh, actually in particular cases drawn from the life of Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, to show just how um, rare it has been in the last 150 years for physicians and veterinarians to truly problem solve together uh, on One Health tasks, tasks like tuberculosis, okay? But anyways, in my trade classes, what I do is I try to give some interesting story, a history on that, that resulted in partnerships between physicians and veterinarians. And why am I doing this? Because I want my students to see that it's possible for real progress to be made by physicians and veterinarians cooperating, okay? So anyways, I'll kind of go through this um, relatively quickly so we can get to the Q&A. But in this case, um, we have um, a Canadian vet, okay? And a Canadian vet is going and investigating in Brooklyn. Remember I told you Brooklyn was shaded red on Lyman's map because Brooklyn, even according to Lyman, had this particular animal disease, cont contagious bovine pleura pneumonia, okay? And um, in his account, or sorry, in um, a veterinarian's account, he talks about being accompanied by Dr. Duncan McEachern, the veterinary inspector of Canada. So you have uh, two veterinarians going into a Brooklyn dairy, and one of them is Canadian, okay? Now, how do you think that went over with the, uh, the Brooklyn dairymen in the dairy in Brooklyn to have a Canadian visitor? Didn't go over very well, right? And... Um, They go into this uh, cow house. There's about 800 cows, all in a filthy condition, okay? So these two veterinarians have gone in. One's Canadian, and they are basically doing an expose on just how filthy this place is, all right? This report ends up being used by the British government to justify some trade restrictions with the U.S. over cattle, all right? But many people argued that this Duncan McEachern, this veterinary inspector from Canada, was really a British agent and was just trying to, um, you know, do this disease expose. So he was pretty much despised by a lot of the folks in New York, okay? So that's, that may not be interesting to you, but that's interesting to a lot of my students, okay? Well, then, what's really interesting... Um, I went to the Brooklyn Public Library and dug up the microfish. I was there with my 14-year-old son sitting at a microfish desk in the Brooklyn Public Library while my son was wanting to go out and skateboard in New York. I said, no, Ian, just stay a little bit longer here in the library with the microfish. I think that was pretty exciting for him. And I found, it took me two days, but I eventually found by scrolling through the microfish, I found this really interesting article, okay? It talks about another veterinarian, some by the name of Dr. McLean. Okay, if you notice, he is a consulting veterinary surgeon. He reports to the Brooklyn Board of Health. Okay, so the Brooklyn Public Health Board has been contracting with this Dr. McLean, who's a veterinarian, not a physician, not a medical officer of health. And basically, what this um, article shows is that this veterinary surgeon was aware of just how filthy and disease-ridden that particular uh, dairy was, okay? What's kind of cool is that this report is being written by who? 
an MD. What's an MD? Marine. A medical doctor, a physician. So we have an instance. This is um, 1879. It's really cool. It's January 28, 1879, which is two days after Britain discovers the disease and a shipment of cattle landed in Liverpool, England. Okay? So this is all sort of going on at the same time. And this veterinarian or this physician with the Brooklyn Board of Health talks about how he worked with a Dr. McLean, a veterinary surgeon. We have a physician and a veterinarian working together. Now, again, this may not be like life changing for you all, but for my veterinary students and my MPH students to read this, this is quintessentially one health. This is the kind of stuff you celebrate, okay? It's kind of interesting. So then I dug up, dug up some more information because of biography to find out a little bit more about who is this Dr. McLean? Who is this veterinary surgeon who was working in Brooklyn and was willing to put up with a snobbish MD physician? Well, he was um, educated in Scotland, okay? And he was um, not a government vet, but a private vet. So you can imagine a veterinarian in Brooklyn in those days, you know, Brooklyn was not covered in spray paint and covered in concrete. It was largely rural still, okay? And this private veterinarian had been, um, he got, kind of got an advisory gig to the public health uh, board. And a lot of my uh, vet students who graduate uh, with master's in public health degrees as a joint degree program, many of those um, veterinarians are gonna go to say a, a rural community in Kansas and they're gonna have a practice but I point to this as an example of how they too could get involved with their local board of health. They don't have to be on the board, but they could give advice on a whole range of One Health matters. And that's exactly what Dr. McLean did. And uh, the, the celebratory point here is that he was a veterinarian working with a physician. It's kind of cool. Um, and it, since then, <laughs> um, I have found some other instances where um, veterinarians were invited to, um, to present research to groups of physicians in Scotland in 1888 to deal with the issue of tuberculosis. And so right now with my freshman uh, pre-vet pre-med honors class, I'm having them read the minutes of the meetings where these physicians and the veterinarian are having this love in and getting along and not insulting each other's profession which by the way, today, even today, doctors and vets are oftentimes putting each other down. Um, just Google vet doctor jokes and you'll find plenty. And so there's a whole uh, gold mine of things I can go after to, in a memorable um, way, showcase what a One Health cooperation really looks like, okay? Um, I won't go through this, but I have the students read um, more about what that veterinarian had to say, okay? And what he emphasized to that Canadian veterinarian, the so-called British agent. It's kind of interesting. Finally, William Williams. I mentioned earlier that, how many minutes we got? Three minutes, okay. I'll just close with William Williams. Uh, this was a veterinarian who disagreed with um, the British government's diagnosis of the animal disease and trade. Um, I have spent the night in this building, which was his vet college in Edinburgh. It's now a uh, private apartment complex. And because I'm a history geek, I begged the owner of the apartment complex if I could stay one night. And they let me stay in their private, um, one of their private rooms with my wife. It's kind of cool. By the chalkboard, there was a, a uh, kind of a, a born hole in the wood. And the rumor is, is that Professor Williams would walk in front of the chalkboard like this, and he would twist on his heel as he was lecturing. And I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to pretend that's true. Um, but, but Williams was a very courageous person because he was a Brit, but he disagreed with his own government's disease diagnosis. And he went so far as to take a stand by saying things like, this is not contagious pleuronomonia, it's just bronchitis. And he went to his death 
arguing that, the, that his own government got the disease diagnosis wrong. And he too, kind of like Gamgee, kind of like Van den Pirabum, was seen as a maverick, okay? Since then, um, through a lot of different circumstances and me doing research and publishing a little bit on Williams, my wife and I have connected with his great granddaughter. She's 70, in her 70s. She's a documentary filmmaker for the BBC, lives in London. And a couple summers ago, Susie and I and our kids went and watched the uh, Kansas musical Wicked. You ever heard of Wicked? We saw that with her in London. It was really, it was actually really weird. It was like, I'm, I'm at a musical with the great granddaughter of this veterinarian that I've been studying for a good part of my life. Um, so that's been kind of cool. Anyways, um, in closing, I would just say that the other thing you might think about, um, if you're, you know, to go back to your example, Rachel, would be to be strategic in what reading material you would select. Because my lectures are only about 20 to 30 minutes long, and then I have the students read things like newspaper accounts or histor historical narratives. So um, be careful about that, and you want to choose wisely. Um, I don't try to give 200 pages of historical reading to my students, but you can give them some reading. And if you notice in Brittany's testimonial, she talks about the book, and that's a good sign. Students are finding the history interesting enough to take the time to read. So with that, I'll stop, and my thanks to Tucker for including me, and thank you all for your attention. So we have another